Uh, bless the Lord, everyone, and welcome to another Bible study. Um, in today's Bible study, we're going to be looking at a simple topic entitled The Mind of Christ. Uh, but before we get started, let us pray. Lord Jesus, we thank you for your goodness and your mercies. Dear God, we thank you for your grace. We thank you, God, for another day that you have given unto us. Dear God, we pray that your presence will be here today with us, that it will lead and it will guide us into your truth. Let your will be done, O God, as we give you all the glory. You alone is worthy of all the praise. In Jesus' name, amen. And so first, the first scripture we want to look at is um, Acts 11, verse 21. And I encourage you today to, to take out your Bibles because we're going to be using the scriptures a lot today. Um, Acts 11, verse 21. Um, here, this gives the account when um, the Bible says that the, the disciples were first called Christians in Antioch. Um, and we want to look at the scriptures. We want to examine the scripture in particular to see what were the circumstances that surround this declaration that was made. So let us look at the scripture. So we, we are starting at 21 just to give, us, give a bit of a context. So 21 said, And the hand of the Lord was with them, and a great number of believed, and a great number believed, and turn unto the Lord. Verse 22 says, Then tidings of these things came unto the ears of the church, which was in Jerusalem. So you know, at Jerusalem is where the church actually started. And they sent forth Barnabas, that he should go as far as Antioch. Verse 23 says, Who, so this is referring directly to Barnabas now, who, when he came and had seen the grace of God. So the Bible said that he had seen the grace of God. So obviously there was a lot happening there. People were probably getting saved. Um, you know, they, there might be some marvelous work, miraculous work that was being done normally. This is an, this is an indication. When, when we see the Bible says, the grace of God. Sometimes it indicates that, you know, there are things that are happening there. The, 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 the scripture said that he was glad, he, Barnabas, was glad, and he exhorted them all that with purpose of heart they, they would cleave unto the Lord. With purpose of heart, the, the, the scripture said, um, they would cleave unto the Lord. And this is a great exhortation that was done by Barnabas here because we find that he's saying that, you know, we're not, just going to, we're not just going to cleave unto the Lord by accident, you know. It's going to take a purpose of heart. It's going to take a made-up mind. We have to decide in our heart that we're going to cleave unto the Lord. We're going to have to be purposeful about it, right? So this is what Barnabas was saying, that it is with purpose of heart that we will be able to cleave unto the Lord. Because you see, what we need to understand is that this world is geared towards pulling us away from God. And everything, and a lot of the things that we do, and some of these things are necessary for life. But at the heart of them, they are, they are, there is that undertone that it is designed to pull us away from God. You know, I believe this whole COVID virus that was around and still is around was also designed to pull us away from God. So here Barnabas is reminding us, um, re reminding the young saints at Antioch that it's going to take a purpose of heart or uh, determining their mind, you know, to, to cleave unto the Lord. So that's the message that he preached. Now listen to what the writer has to say about Barnabas, because this is important 
in us understanding why this statement was made. So this is the writer now that is giving his opinion. He said, for he was a good man. This is Luke making reference to Barnabas. And he's saying that Barnabas exhort the crowd like that, exhort the church like that, because he, Barnabas, was a good man. And he was a man that was full of the Holy Ghost. Again, there is an implication there. Normally, when the Bible refers to someone as being full of the Holy Ghost, it's normally an indication that they are operating the gifts of the Spirit. You know, there are some miraculous work that was being done. Um, case in point, if we look at Stephen, I think the same, the same um, description was used as Stephen, that he was a man, you know, full of the Holy Ghost. And you see, the Bible says, mighty work was done through him. So it could be here, we are reasoning from Silent, but it could be that, you know, um, Barnabas was actually performing some form of mirac miraculous work. For the writer to make this statement of him, he said he was full of the Holy Ghost and full of faith. And the Bible said, and much people was added unto the Lord. So he was doing the work of an uh, evangelist. Now in verse 25, the scripture simply said that he went and he actually, then he departed Barnabas to Tarsus for to seek Saul. This is Saul, as we know him, Paul who wrote almost a quarter of the New Testament, or a little over a quarter of the New Testament. So he went and he sought for Saul, or Paul as we know it. And then verse 26, in verse 26, he returned. They said, and when he had found him, he found Paul, he brought him unto Antioch. And it came to pass that a whole year they assembled themselves with the church and taught much people. All right? So this is, the, this is the background, this is the circumstance around the statement that was made. Now, the, 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 the scripture went on to say, and, notice the word and, we're going to come back to it. The Bible says, and the disciples were called Christians first in Antioch. Right, so this is, a, this is a momentous occasion. This is the first time that this phrase is being used as a description to the disciples. Right? Throughout history, we have now come to know, the term has now come to represent anyone, anyone that calls on Christ, anyone that is now, a um, is now a follower of Christ. We call them Christians. Um, before this, you know, they were, made, they, were, they were referred to as, our Christianity was referred to as the way. If you read the, the, the book of Acts, sometimes you will hear the writer talk about the way or this way. It's really a, a reference to Christianity, you know. But it was here at Antioch that they were first called Christian. And notice the writer links it and he said, and the disciples were first called Christian. First in Antioch. That word there, and, is really saying, is the writer giving us a hint to say that the re he was actually linking the declaration that was made to what had proceeded. So it was because they were great, they were doing the work of a teacher. The, the Bible said that they, he and Paul was teaching and many people were being taught. So that was one of the reasons, and I believe by extension, he was, it, it was referring to some of the things that would have happened before, where it relates to the Bible give, this, um, give the character of Barnabas, that he was full of faith, and that he was um, you know, full of the Holy Ghost. And we know Paul, and we know Paul is, is similar to that. He's a man that is full of faith and filled with the Holy Ghost, full of the Holy Ghost. And so from all indication, the writer is suggesting that it was really a positive, um, you know, it was based on their, their personality, based on their character, based upon the miracles that they were probably doing, or, you know, the Holy Ghost was doing through them, and based upon their teaching, why they were called disciples. Now, when you read... Um, 
some of the documents that are out there, you know, I have come across some documents that actually say, you know, that the, that, um, that actually say that this was a negative statement that was made here, you know. There are documents that you have read that say that it was a nickname. And in saying that it was a nickname, they are saying that they, were, they had called them cry, Christians, mockingly. They were mocking them. And, you know, maybe there are instances or some locations where this was true. You know, I'm not saying that. The Bible, however, didn't support this view, but, you know, it could be true. Historically, you know, it is said. But certainly, here in Antioch, it was a positive um, declaration that was made based on the character of the persons, based on the wonderful work that they were doing, based on the fact that they were like Christ, it seems, and they would remind the, the people of when Christ was upon the earth. They were operating in the same vein. They were probably doing the same type of work in terms of miracles and teaching. And so this is why, you know, the scripture seemed to suggest that um, the, the term was coined and given to the, Christ, um, and given to the disciples of, of Christ. Now we know that throughout history now, everywhere it is people who even believe at, in Christ, just have a huge inclination of Christ. They are called Christian. This wasn't this, the case before, but these people were really, really close to the behavior that Christ had, you know, at the time. Now, when we look at the, the, the term, when we look at the term, and when we look at the definition of the term Christians, a Christian is really defined as a follower of Christ, a follower, one that follows Christ, one that... Um, one that follows Christ, you know, that's what the, it means. You know, some person said it means like Christ and so on and so forth. The thing about this scripture, the thing about this definition or the use of this term, um, follower of Christ, is that Jesus himself like the term. Jesus himself like the term. And this is very interesting. And when you look, when you study the gospel, you will find that Jesus used the term. But he didn't say followers of Christ because he was Christ. So he said, follow me. And he used the term extensively. And I was even surprised at how often Jesus would use this terminology. And so, before, um, we are going to look at a couple scripture where Jesus himself used the term, you know, follow me, which is the exact same thing as, you know, follower of Christ. All right, so let us look at first at Mark um, 14, 4, verse 19. Now, this is the account of Jesus calling his disciples. Now, I want you to understand that calling his disciples was a big deal. I believe it was a big deal because here he is calling men and women. He's calling men and women. He's calling men and women. That is Mark 4, verse 19. He, he's calling men and women, you know, who is going to leave the, 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 the entire work that he's doing, the gospel, the saving of soul, he's going to leave the, um, that work in their hands. So that's a big deal. It's a big thing, you know, because Jesus himself, um, as, as depicted in the, in the gospel, he blessed the bread and gave it to his disciples to distribute to the, to the people. It is kind of a type of the entire gospel plan of God where he will hand down actually the word of God the word of God to 
um, you know, to saints, to, to believers, through his disciples, right? And let me correct myself. This is Matthew 4, verse 19, right? So he, um, you know, he's going to leave. The Bible says that he has committed unto us the word of reconciliation. And so the disciples were really people they were like foundations. They were like not just followers of Christ. They were disciples. They were apostles. And so how would Jesus call them was very important. You know? Yes, it was Jesus that was calling them. That alone would make it important. But the words that he chose to use, I believe, also is important. And, 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 and I want you to recall that Jesus is omniscient. Right? He's omniscient. He knows everything. He knows all the profound words, all the profound um, phrases that, could, that is out there. Even before they are used, he knows them. He could have put a lot of big words together and, you know, and say something profound in, in terms of how he calls his disciples. But I believe it's strategic that he used, he chose to use this simple phrase. You know, the scripture said he said unto them, follow me, follow me. The same, almost exact definition of, what a Christ, of who a Christian is, a follower of Christ. He said to his disciples, these disciples here, follow me. And he added the, the terminology, and I will make you fishers of men. Fine, so he had that terminology there. Now, let us look at another instance of Jesus calling his disciples. Let us look at Matthew 8, verse 22. So in Matthew 8, verse 22, again, we see Jesus using the same term, the same, I don't want to say basic, but the same two words, as it were, to call his disciples. These are, and again, I reiterate, these are persons that he's going to left in charge of the gospel. The gospel is the most precious thing in the entire world. And this is how Jesus is calling them. He said unto this disciple, he said, follow me and let the dead bury their dead. So this is another instance of Jesus using the term follow me. As I said, it is a very, it's a term that is used extensively by him. Now, let us look at Mar, Matthew 9, verse 9. And this, I believe, is the call of Matthew. And here, you know, Matthew was a tax collector. He was, um, it probably was a high rank job in that time. Probably would have had to learn it. Probably would have to go to school. And Jesus, the Bible says, and Jesus passed forth from then he saw a man named Matthew sitting on receipt of custom, at the receipt of custom, pardon. And he says unto him, follow me. That's all he said. He didn't say anything else. He just went to the man and said, follow me. And the Bible said, and he arose and followed him. The, the, the man leave his job. The man leave all the plans, everything that he had planned to do, he left it. Why? Because Jesus simply go to him and say, follow me. And so, and, and so I believe that the term itself, it, it, there is a weight behind it. And that is why Jesus used it so often. And we're going to look at some other instances where Jesus used the term. Um, Matthew 19, verse 16 to 20 Give us the account of the rich young ruler. Right? Give us the account of the rich young ruler. And we, you know, we know what, what, what happened there. Um, the Bible says, And behold, one came and said unto him, Good master, what good thing shall I do that I may have eternal life? That is verse 16. Verse 17 said, And he said unto him, Why callest thou me good? There is none good but one. Now notice Jesus was not saying that he was good, wasn't good. But he was really saying to the man, Are you clear on what you are saying? You are calling me good. 
Do you understand what you are actually saying when you are calling me good? You are saying that I am that one that is good. I am the Messiah. I am the Christ. Are you aware of that? This is, you know, reading behind what Jesus was saying when he said, Why callest thou me good? Um, and then Jesus responded and said, um, None good but one, that is God, right? But if thou wilt enter into life, keep the commandments. So Jesus said, keep the commandments. Keep the commandments if you want to enter into eternal life. The man responds and say, he said unto him, which Jesus, um, which Jesus said, thou shalt do no murder. So, sorry. So he said unto him, which Jesus said, turn a little awkward, thou shalt do no murder. Thou shalt not commit adultery. So Jesus was reminding the man about the commandments. Thou shalt not steal. Thou shalt not bear false witness. Honor thy father and thy mother, and thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. So Jesus reminded the man about the basic the, the commandments. The young man said unto him, All these have I kept from my youth up. What lacketh I? Right? So the man said, all of these things, I am aware of them, and I have kept them from I was a youth up. But I recognize that these things, they don't fulfill me as I think they should have. Right? The man says, what lacketh I? And I know, excuse me, I know preachers like to give this man a hard time. You know, and sometimes even I give him a hard time. But this man was ahead of where some of us are, right? Because he recognized that there was something missing in his life. He recognized that, you know, he lacked something. And that is half of the problem. A lot of the persons are not Christians because they don't recognize this. They don't realize that, you know, there is something lacking. So the man said, all these things have I kept from my youth up. What lack it? I, right? And what? Look at Jesus' response. Verse twenty-one. So Jesus said unto him, "If thou wilt be perfect, go and sell that thou hast, and give to the poor." And thou shalt have treasures in heaven. And a lot of us, you know, stop there. But, he, but Jesus went on. He said, and come follow me. Again, that same word he is using there. Come follow me or follow me. Yes, you know, I believe, that, you know, there are some things for this man to be perfect. For this man to be perfect. Jesus gave him two things that he had to do. One, he had to sell all he had. He had to go sell all that he had and give to the poor. That was one part of the thing. But the other part, that, we, as I said, we don't emphasize so much, was that Jesus said to the man, follow me. You know, when you really look at these scriptures, you, you, you can really say that, well, Jesus wanted the man to sell the things that he had because they would prevent him from following him. So the true essence of the scripture, really, when it comes back down, is look, it comes back down to those two words. Jesus was saying to the rich young ruler, if you are going to be perfect, you need to follow me. Right? So, again, we see the, the use of the term, follow me, here. Right? Now, Jesus, as I said, he uses extensively. In terms of discipleship, it is used in Matthew 10, verse 37 to 38. It is used again in Matthew 10, verse 30, sorry, in Luke 14, verse 27. All right, let us look at these scriptures. Um, all right, so here Jesus, he, so, so here Jesus is telling them, telling the persons, you know, what is required to be a disciple. 
He said, he that loveth father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. Right? So Jesus is saying that, you know, you have to love your father. He's not saying we shouldn't love our fathers. He's not saying we shouldn't love our mothers. But he's saying that we can't love them more than how we love him. And then he went on and he said, he that loveth son or daughter, you know, is not our daughter more than me, is not worthy of me. Right? Again, he's saying, you need to love your son and your daughter. You can't love them more than me. And he went on, he didn't stop there, he went on and he said, and he that taketh not his cross and follow after me, the same word, a little worded a little differently, but it's the same phrase, is not worthy of me. Is not worthy of me. Let us look at Luke 14, verse 27. Luke 14, verse 27 said, And whosoever does not bear his cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. You know, same principle. You have to bear your cross and follow me. Right? And so, and there are many other scriptures in the Bible. Um, there, is, there is John 21 verse 19 to 22. There is Luke 9, verse 23. There is St. John 8, verse 12. There is John 10, verse 27. All these, and, and there are more times in the scripture that Jesus used this terminology. Follow me. You know? Obviously, it is something that is important to him. Obviously, it is something that is the embodiment of what Christianity is truly about, right? And when, and you know, just to add a few more references. And so we we see not only Jesus using the term, but when we look at First Corinthians eleven, when we look at First Corinthians eleven verse one, we see Paul using. The same terminology. Paul says that, um, be followers of me, even as I also am of Christ. So Paul is saying that you need to follow me as I follow Christ. And when you look at the definition of the term, as it is used here in 1 Corinthians 11, verse 1, the term really means to imitate Right? It means to imitate Christ or to imitate Paul. So Paul is saying that, or the, the, the scripture is saying that we need to imitate God. Right? We need to imitate Christ. We need to be like him. We need to walk the way he walked. We need to talk the way he talked. We need to sound the way he sound. Right? We need to be imitator of Christ. Okay, so let us look at Matthew 10, verse 25. And, and let us, um, actually let us first look at, I think it's Proverbs 29, verse 18. Proverbs 29, verse 18. So Proverbs 29 verse 18 says, you know, where there is no vision, the people perish. But he that keepeth the law is happy. So without a vision, we always say, without a vision, the people perish. And so when we look based on the, based on the frequent use of the scripture, right? It is, it is, it is um, evident that Christ wants us to have this as our vision. Right? Not just to follow him, you know, but to be like him. Right? 
There's a scripture, I think, in Matthew 10, verse 25. Let us go to that scripture also. Jesus wants us to be like him. Right? Yes, and this scripture brings it out quite clearly. So Jesus is speaking here, and he's saying, it is enough, or it is sufficient for the disciples that he be as his master. It is, it is enough, it is sufficient for the disciples to be as his master, and a servant as his Lord. Right? So here Jesus is saying, Jesus is setting the standard. He's saying that, look here, it is enough for you to be like me. Right? That is the aim. That is our focus. And when Jesus say we should follow him, and, and even as Paul used it in, in 1 Corinthians, we are to imitate him. In essence, Jesus is saying we are to be like him. Right? We are to be like him. We are to be like Christ. We are to be Christ-like. That is the vision. And without the vision, the people perish. So we are, I believe we are to embrace this vision or this mantra. You know, and determine in our minds that we are going to follow Christ. That we are going to follow Christ. Not just to, you know, that's that, not just to follow him in the, in the general sense of the word, but we are going to spend the rest of our life to be like Christ. Right? We have to spend, as Christians, that is what we are called. We are called to be like Christ. The Bible said we are to put on Christ. Right? And make no provision for the flesh. And so it is important as Christians that we embrace this vision and that we, you know, whatever else we are doing and whatever, you know, areas we are working in, whether it is mini, um, evangelism or whatever ministry you are involved in, you know, that, yes, you need to do that too. But a central part of your plan is for, is for each day you become a little bit more like Jesus. Each, each day, we should become a little bit more like him. And we sing the song, just to be like Jesus, just to be like Jesus. I only want to be like him. Yes, that should be all, the only thing that we truly want, you know, to be like Jesus. So let us look at... Um, John 3, 1 John 3 and verse 2. First John 3 and verse 2 said, Beloved, now are, now are we the sons of God, and it does not yet appear what we shall be. So John is saying, Saint John is saying, John the Beloved, I believe, is saying that, you know, it does not yet appear what we shall be. The fullness, the full understanding of what it means to be a son of God, you know, it's not clear to us as yet. But he went on to say, but we know that are he knows rather, he said, but we know that when he shall appear, we shall be like him. For we shall see him as he is. Now I want you to, I want to point out to you, and when you look at the scripture here, um, John is making a declaration. He's saying that when, when the Lord will ap shall appear, when Jesus returns, I believe that this is what the scripture is saying. We are going to look, we are going to be like him. As I said, we come back to the definition of 
of Christian. Christian means to follow up, one that follows Christ, you know, one that who is like Christ. So here, um, John is saying that when the Lord shall appear, when the Lord will return, we are going to be like him. But not only did he state or tell us that we are going to be like him, but he tells us why we are going to be like him. Look at the last phrase. It says, for we shall see him as he is. That's what, that, that's what that scripture, that's what that phrase means, you know. John is telling us, why is it that we are going to be like Christ when he shall appear? And it is because we shall be, we are, um, sorry, it's because we are going to see him as he is. Um, there is a wonderful relationship or a correlation between seeing God and being like God. We can only imitate, to use the, the phrase that the Bible used, we can only successfully imitate the portion of Christ that we see. Right? And so if we don't see him, we can't be like him. If we don't see him, we can't be like him. Okay? Now, this is a, a what you call a core, a fundamental principle in the scriptures, right? In order for us to be like Christ, we have to see him. And as I said, this scripture tells us we are going to be, you know, the, the scripture says that when he shall appear, when Jesus shall return, we are going to be like Jesus. And, and it tells us why. Because at that time, we are not going to see him through a glass that is darkly painted, as the scripture says. You know, but we are going to, be, but we are going to see him as he is. Now Paul said it in another, using some different, a more elegant term. In, fir, in 2 Corinthians 3 and verse 18, right? Paul basically said the same thing in 2 Corinthians um, 3, 3 and verse 18. So this is Paul now, and he's saying that, but we all with open face, beholding as in a glass, the glory of the Lord. So, so Paul is saying that we are beholding, as in a glass, the glory of the Lord. And he went on to say that of the Lord are changed into the same image. So the image that we see of the Lord we are changed into that image. That's what that scripture is saying. Into the same image from glory to glory. So it is not just, it's not just a one-time change. It's not that you just look at, at Christ and you see Christ and you just change into the glory of Christ like that. No, because the scripture says that light is sown unto the upright daily. So each day we look at Christ, each day we see an image of Christ, you know, it's an opportunity for us to be transformed and to be changed into that image of Christ that we see. You know, and the scripture said, of course, that this is done as by the Spirit of the Lord. Right? This is done as by the the spirit of the Lord. Now we see this played out. We see this 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 play, played out in the life of Job. Right? And if you turn to Job 40, 42 verse 5, you will see what I'm talking about here. Job 
So verse Job 42 verse 5, Job is saying, I have heard of thee by the hearing of the ear, but no mine eyes have seen thee. Verse um, 40, ver, um, verse 6. Go, you can go to verse 6. Wherefore, I abhor myself and repent in, in dust and ashes. Now, if you can remember, when Job was a man that one of the few individuals that the Bible actually testified that he was righteous. Jesus himself, um, God himself said it, that Job is a righteous man. Right? Now, when, when Job calamity came upon him, you know, the Bible mentioned that he... You know, he complained in, in, in the, I think there's a, there's a chapter, either verse 3 or verse 4, where he cursed the day that he born and all of that, right? Now, after this, the Bible said that three of his friends came to look for Job. And these friends, they all took part in trying to convince Job that he did something wrong. Right? They, they all took part in trying to convince him. They said, look here, Job, you must do something wrong. There is no way that God is going to allow all these calamity to come upon you unless you sin. And Job, and, and when you read the scripture, Job was adamant. Job was adamant that, he, look here, I did nothing wrong. I am righteous. Let us look at, um, at Job 33, verse 9. And you see this coming out here. So this is, this is Elohim, Elo, Elo, who I believe. Um, and he is, liter he's co he's actually quoting Job. And he said, I am clean without transgression. I am innocent, neither is there iniquity in me. So this, this was what Job hold to. Right? This is how Job saw himself as being innocent, as being, you know, without transgression, as being without iniquity. Job, Job saw himself as being right, as being righteous before God. That's how he saw himself all the time. And there was nothing that these three, his three friends could say or do to convince him otherwise. However, the scripture that we have read uh, before, um, verse 45, um, chapter 45, let's go back to that other scripture in Job. This scripture now documents Job um, experience with God. Now, remember, you know, before, nobody couldn't convince him that he did anything wrong. But hear what Job had to say when he come, when he saw God, when he came into the presence of God and saw God for who he is. He said, I have heard of thee, speaking of, um, referring to God, Job is saying, I have heard of thee, God. By the hearing of the, he of the ear. I have heard what people have to say about thee. I have read about thee in, you know, thee in books and whatever. However, I have heard of thee. But he said, but know that mine eyes see thee. So it's a different when you see God. It is a different when you come in the presence of, of Christ. Right? And notice what he said. This is the man that said, look here, I am righteous. Go to verse 6. This is the man that said, I am righteous. I am without transgression and there is no iniquity in me. This is what the man said about himself. Know that he is seeing himself in the light of God. 
or through the eyes of Christ. He said, wherefore I abhor myself. Not just, not just, that's a strong word he's using there, you know. Job is saying, I abhor myself. I, I am disgusted at what I am seeing now in me. Before he came in the presence of God, nobody could tell him that he's right. He's not righteous. After he see God, the Bible said, Job said, when my eyes have seen thee, I abhor myself, Job said, and I repent in dust and in ashes. Right, so what has changed? He now see himself through the eyes of God or in the presence of God. And it is a common thing in the scriptures. We have seen it more than once that when an individual comes in the presence of God, you know, he sees the true image of who he is. And a lot of times you see people that Christians that they are boasting and they are they believe that they are all that. And that is always an indication to me that this person has not really have a true experience with God as yet. You know, they have not really been in the presence of God. Because anytime you go in the presence of God. You begin to see yourself for who you are. Right? The same thing that happened. Now let us look at in Isaiah, in Isaiah 6, you know, verse 1 to 8. Um, Isaiah said, In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw also the Lord. He was high and lifted up. And his train filled the temple. Verse 2 says, Above it stood the seraphims. Each one had six wings. With twain he covered his face. With twain he covered his eyes. Um, his feet. And with twain he did fly. Verse 3 said, And one cried on an, on another, on, and one cried unto another and said, Holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. Verse 4 says, And the post of the door, um, and the post of the door moved at the voice of him that cried. And the house was filled with smoke. Verse 5 says, Then said I, now this is the declaration. Again, the man had seen God. He was all right up until this point. But now he see God. This is what he said. Woe is me. For I am undone. I am incomplete. Just breaking down the word undone. I am spoiled. I have been degraded by sin. And I am less than who the Lord had intended me to be. He said woe is me because I am undone. He said because I and, and he went on to explain why. But it's a, it's, it is a common occurrence that when we see, when we come in the presence of God, we will see ourselves as we ought. And often time, you know, it will lead to repentance. Right? Often times. And so this is what happened here to Job. It happened to Job, it happened to, Dan, to Daniel. And and I believe it is important for us as we grow in God and as we move from one step to the next, it, it is important for us to have that experience and it is, what, it is what will actually take us to another level, right? Notice Job was righteous. Notice that the, 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 the scripture says that Job was righteous. The Bible said that Job was righteous. He was at a level of righteousness. Right? Just like how 
you and I are at probably a level of righteousness. Right? We are, we are saved. We, we, we are baptized. We, we are filled. We receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. And we are trying to live a holy life. That is a level of righteousness there that we have attained. However, just like it took an experience with God, we are <coughs> Job was able to see he thought he was righteous. But when he saw himself in the light, in the revealed light of God, he recognized that that level of righteousness that he had was was really filthiness before God. And he, the scripture said he abhorred himself. He was disgust at himself. This is necessary for us in order for us to go to the next level. In order for us to go to the next level, we have to see ourselves through the eyes of God as being nothing, as being really disgusting in the eyes of God. And we have to, and that is what, that is what is going to bring us to repentance. And that is what is going to catapult us to another level in God. Right? It is necessary. It is necessary. So yes, there are some growth that we will receive within a, I call it within a band, as it were. You know? But... When we're going to make a step to another, another level, like as Job did, I want you to understand that Job, before the calamity took him and before he came into the presence of God and before he repented of the state that he was in, which at first he thought it was okay, but now he repented of it. This Job could not you know, that old Job couldn't hold a candle to this Job. He would have grown tremendously through the experience that God would have brought him through, which culminates, which, you know, ended with him repenting and being basically placed at another level, I believe. And so it is important for us to, um, to see God it is important for us to have a revelation of who God is. And so it's not all the time it's going to be it's not all the time it's going to be as dramatic as you know what happened to Job where we see image of God. It's not all the time it's going to be like how it happened in Isaiah 6 verse 9 where the, the, there was smoke and the place was filled with the glory and the presence of God. It's not all the time it's going to happen like that. But, but we can acquire knowledge of Christ um, daily as the scripture says, right? We can acquire knowledge of Christ daily. Now there are there are a couple of source that we can look to in order for us to acquire this knowledge of, of Christ. There, there, and and there, there are probably more, but I want to highlight two of those sources today. Um, let us look at Matthew 16, verse 17. So in Matthew 16, verse 17, the scripture said, All right, so this is um, Peter's response. This is Peter's response to a question that Jesus asked. Jesus asked, you know, who do men say that I am? And he, you know, persons responded, and then he asked, but who do you say that I am? And the scripture said, and Peter said, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. Right? 
Now, Jesus responded. Now, Peter made a declaration. He said, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. And maybe in his mind, he thought, Peter probably thought that, you know, the thought was just coming from him. He probably just thought that, you know, it just come in his mind and he said, Peter probably didn't know that this was actually a revelation from God until Jesus said it. Jesus said, blessed art thou, Simon um, Barjona, blessed art thou. thou art, and the word there, blessed means worthy to be envied. You know, you are in a blessed position. When we can reveal, when we receive revelation from God, that is an enviable position. You know, we thought that it was the rich guy that is blessed. We thought that it was the guy with the fancy car that is blessed. Jesus is saying no. Well, he's not saying no, but he's saying that this is the guy that is truly blessed. The person that can receive a revelation from God. So he said, Blessed art thou, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood has not revealed it unto thee, but my Father which is in heaven. So that is one source of revelatory knowledge of Christ. The, you know, the Spirit of God will reveal aspects of Christ to us. Right? Um, as, as, it, as it's happening here. Now I want, you to, I want to make the point here that this was actually before Peter received the gift of the Holy Ghost. This was before he actually received the gift of the Holy Ghost. This was while he was with Christ, you know, and he didn't, he wasn't filled with the Holy Ghost at this point. So then, if he can receive this revelation, even before he had received the Spirit, that experience in Acts 2.38, you know, how much more are you and I who have, you know, who have received the Spirit of God is in a position where God can reveal things about Christ to us. Right? It is um it is something worth looking into. Now the next thing we want to look at is 1 Corinthians 2 and verse 16. And this is Paul actually putting it in his own words, as it were. So Paul is saying here, so we're, so we're still on the first source. So just to, just to be clear, I'm saying one of the source of knowledge of Christ is through the revelation of God. You know, Christ will reveal himself to us directly through the Spirit. Right? That is one source of knowledge of, of Christ. And, um, and, and 1 Corinthians 2 verse 16 um, support this. Right? So, so Paul says, for who has known the mind of the Lord? It's a rhetorical question. He's saying, who really know the mind of the Lord that he may instruct him? Right? But we have the mind of Christ. Let us look at 17. Verse 17 also. Okay, all right, let us, let us look at a couple of verses above that. Um, let us start at verse 13. I want, I'm, I'm looking for an actual quote here. All right, so, um, so 1 Corinthians 2, um, let us start at verse, um, a bit back, verse 10, to verse 10, start at verse 10. 
All right, so yeah, so he says, But God has revealed unto us by his Spirit, for the Spirit searches all things. Yeah, this is the scripture I was looking for. Yea, the deep things of God. So, so Paul is saying that the, the Spirit, same Spirit that we have received, it searches all things, right? And it also searches the deep things of God. Verse 11. Verse 11 says, For what man knoweth the things of a man, save the spirit of man which is in him. Right? So what Paul is simply saying here is that, look here, there is a spirit that is in me. Right? There is a spirit that is in me. And that spirit that is in me, it knows everything about me. Right? That's what he's saying here. For what man knoweth the things of a man save the spirit of man which is in him. Right? So the spirit that is in us, it truly knows us. And he went on, he said, even so, the things of God knoweth no man but the spirit of God. Right? Verse, tw verse 12. So now he went on to say, No, we have received not the spirit of the world. We have, he says, No, we receive not the spirit of the world. So you see, if we had received the spirit of the world, you know what would have happened? We would have known everything about the world. We would have been millionaires. We would have known every strategy, every smart move that we need to make in order to flourish in this world. But Apostle Paul is saying, that's not the spirit we receive. We didn't receive the spirit of the world. We didn't receive a spirit that caused us to be worldly or give us knowledge about the things of the world. You know? No. But we receive the spirit which is of God. That we might know the things that are freely given to us of God. Uh, look, look, at, look at verse 13. All right, so verse 13 says that, which things also we speak, not in word, which, which, which is man's wisdom teaches, but the Holy Ghost teaches, comparing spiritual things with, spirit, with spiritual. Right, verse 14. And he went on to speak about now that the natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness unto him. They don't make sense to him. They are not logical. Neither can he know them, or neither can he, you know, understand them, because they are spiritually learned, are spiritually deserved. So, so sum this up, and as I get ready to, to close, right, um, Paul is saying here that we have been given the mind of Christ, the actual mind of Christ. And so when we receive the spirit of, of Christ, the Holy Ghost, it is the same spirit that was in Christ, Jesus. That's where, that's where he was going with this. It's the same spirit that was in Christ, Jesus. It, was, it is the same spirit that knows everything about Christ. As he said before, you know, no man really knows a man except the spirit of the man that is in him. And so the spirit that is in Christ knows everything about Christ. And it is that spirit that is given to us. So now we have the capacity, we have the ability to know everything there is to know about Christ. Right? So that is what Paul is saying, through the Spirit. And so this is one source of the knowledge of Christ. This is one source of the knowledge of Christ. Through the Spirit that um, Christ 
has given unto us. God will reveal himself unto us. Unto us. Um, you know, and it is different as, as, as Job pointed out. When you read about it somewhere in some book that somebody writes, it is different, you know, it, it, it does not impact you the same as how it will impact you when God himself do it. Like what we see in Job, when Job say, you know, I've heard of thee, but now that mine eyes have seen thee, the impact of it is different. And so it is essential for us, as we seek to become more like God, it is essential that we seek to learn more about him. And as we learn more, you know, about God, that is how we will in turn, you know, become more like him or be able to, to imitate him. So the Holy Spirit that he has given to us is one way that we can um, acquire knowledge of him. Now, there's another way that we are able to acquire knowledge of Christ. Right? There's another way that we are able to acquire knowledge of Christ. And this is through the word of God. Right? This is through the word of God. When Jesus, Jesus came on the earth, and as he communicated with the Pharisees, you know, he said to the Pharisees, he said, you know, search the scriptures. Jesus said, search the scriptures. Now, he wasn't speaking now about the New Testament scriptures. He was speaking about the, the law and the prophets, the Old Testament scripture. And he said, look here, search the scripture, because in them he thinks he have, you have eternal life. But these are the scriptures that really testify of me. And so what am I saying here? The entire Bible is really centered around Jesus Christ. And you can find Jesus in Genesis. You can find him in Exodus, Leviticus. All the, the books in the Bible is really referring to Christ. So, so he said, search the scripture because, you know, they testify of me. And this was an indictment on the Pharisees because the Pharisees claimed that they knew the scriptures. Yet, Jesus came as the scriptures personified. He came as the word personified. In St. John, the Bible says that, you know, the word became flesh. The word of God became flesh. So he was the embodiment of the word. So if they knew the scriptures, they should have identified him. They should have been able to say, you know, there is something about him. You know? But they didn't because they understand the letter of the scripture, but they didn't understand the spirit. They didn't, they didn't fully understand. They know what it says, you know. But they didn't get the substance behind it. And so that is why they missed Jesus. Or they, didn't under, they, they, they didn't recognize him as... You know, that the, as the word becoming flesh. Right? So that is one place where we can find knowledge of Christ, actually. In the Old Testament scriptures. But another place that we can find knowledge of Christ, and um, in particularly, we, are, we, are, we, we can find knowledge about his life, we can find knowledge about his teaching. We can find knowledge about his, the miracles that he worked and, and, and his mantra and all of that. One source of those, of that knowledge, is the gospel. Right? It is a rich, it is a place that is filled with the knowledge of Jesus Christ. You know? And so, as I said, this is really an introduction um, in the next couple of weeks, we are going to dive more into the, the gospel. We're going to be looking at the teachings of Christ. 
we're going to be looking at some of the miracles that he did. Um, you know, time permits, we may look at, also look at, you know, his passion, the, the week of his passion. You know, so, you know, it should be about three to four to four weeks, um, depending on... Um, depending on how much we get covered in, in the time. All right, so, yeah, so, so the, 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 these books, these four books, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, these books will give us, you know, knowledge about, about who God is. And, and I believe that it is important for us to study these books and to look at them because they reveal so much. They reveal so much about, about God, about Christ, and, and, and what he was, and who he was rather. And as we, as we seek to imitate him, as we seek to imitate Christ, you know, it is important for us that we don't just seek to imitate his actions, right, but that we imitate his mantra or the thing that drove him. It is important. And, um, but when, just a little preface for, for what we're coming up with next. So when we look at the, the Old Testament, when we look at the New Testament, we see where, you know, the, the, the Bible make mention of his birth, make mention of his birth, and um, then the next time we hear of him is when he was about 12, when he got lost. And, well, he didn't get lost, actually, but his, his mother and father was unable to find him. And I, 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 I asked myself, you know, why did, why did the writer put this? Why did the writer put this... Um, this incident in the Bible. It is, you know, you know the, the, the writer spoke about his birth, and then we, we didn't hear anything more about him um, till maybe when he was two, I'm not sure if he, something was mentioned there. But we didn't hear anything about him again until he was 12. And then, no, we didn't hear anything again about him until he was until his ministry when he was about in his 30. And I asked myself, why this, this, this little scripture, this, this little verse, this little story is being told here about, about the boy Jesus? And when you look at the story, well, you know the story well, right? So it's about when um, they went, he and his parents went, I think to, to, to pay tax, I believe. And when they were coming back, you know, his parents thought that he was with them, that, you know, and they would have traveled maybe a day or two journey, only to find out that he was not with them and that he was actually, and they had to return and look for him. And as he, and when, he, when, when they found him, you know, his mother said to him, you know, but why you do this to us, Jesus? You know, why you do this to us? And he turned and he said to, he turned and he said to them, uh, he turned and he said to Mary, um, know ye not that I would have to be about my father's business. He said, know ye not that I would have to be about my father's business. Right? And I looked at it and I'm saying, but why is it here? Why is it here? And I believe, and this is my opinion here now, I believe the writer wanted to give us a, a life mantra or a purpose that for Christ that spans his entire life. Right? That's what I believe. And when you look at, at why, when you look at the, the subject and what was being discussed here, the essence of the scripture was that Jesus had to be about his father's business. 
That was the essence of the scripture. Jesus had to be about his father's business. When we look at, and we're going to come to these scriptures, when we look at the, the gospel, we recognize that he repeated. When, when, when he went to um, Samaria, um, you know, the disciples came unto him and said, Master, eat. And he said, you know, my meat is to do the will of God and to finish it. It was really the same, repeating this, it was really the same thing he was saying in another, you know, using some other words. And so I believe the writer was trying to get a life mantra, something that guided Jesus throughout his entire life. Not just his ministry where we see, we have a lot of information about that, that three and a half years of his ministry. Not just that. But I believe he dropped that in there to, to let us know that, you know, it wasn't just the last three years he was driven by that passion to do the master's will. But even as a child, even as a 12-year-old, that was his, his mantra. That was the thing that drives him. And so as we seek to imitate him, and as I close, I want us not just to, to imitate his action, but let us try and be driven by that same passion that drove him. And what is that passion? The passion was to be able to do the master's business and to complete it. You know? That is what drove a lot of the work that he did. You know, he didn't do it to be recognized by others. He thought little of praise and the glory of men, and he, but, he, um, but he only sought to feel, fulfill the plan that God has laid out for him. All right, so as I said, this is just an introduction to you know, some of the other lessons that we'll be going into. Um, we're going to be, as I said, the topic is the mind of Christ. We're going to be looking at some of these teaching. We're going to be looking at his miracles. Some of them, not all. Some of the miracles. And, you know, the, the passion week. Um, so that is it for now. Um, I trust that you would have garnered some amount of something that you can apply to your walk with God. And that through this, you know, you, you will, it will lead you to have a more impactful relationship with God. Thank you, and God bless you all. Amen. So there's a few announcements that we, are, we have. So just give me a minute, let me read those. So the announcement is um, there's a funeral service for Sister Burton this Friday, 10 a.m. at Court of Praise, um, Spanish Town. And this, you know, this is Pastor Simpson's church. Uh, please place your order. So this is another announcement. Please place your order now for Jerk Friday. So you know, Jerk Friday is July 29th, and you can call the office. Um, the numbers are there, 931-0081. You can call between 8.30 a.m. and 4 p.m. The menu is jerk, barbecue chicken. You have, we have jerk pork and we have fish. And this is, the fish is done to order. So you have to place your order for all of these. Um, Faith Apostolic Ministry, Portmore, Ascot, that is um, Pastor Campbell's church. Um, is having men in praise. It's called Shabak. And this is also on July 29th at 6.30 p.m. on Waterford. This is at Waterford, open lot. So it's an open lot at Waterford. And of course, refreshment will be on sale. Um, reminder that we're having our culture week, the end of August. This is August 5th, 6th, and 7th, that is supposed to be Friday, Saturday, and Sunday, at, and this is at 53 Mullines Road.
So August 5th will be a talent night. That's a Friday. August 6th, we are going to have a day of authentic food, fellowship games, and exhibition of talent. So that's August 6th. On August 7th, that's a Sunday, a special, there will be a special service of thanksgiving and praise. And we are inviting you to come in your Jamaica colors. So you wear your colors, your green and your yellow and your black. All right. Thank you all again. God bless you.